Okay, here we are. Hello, everyone. I am so thrilled to welcome you all to uh, the NYU Fish Institute for Global Sport Chalk Talk. Uh, we have, as full-time faculty members, uh, every semester we do a topical chalk talk. Uh, my uh, series here is called The Athlete Voice. Uh, this edition or installment is called The Storytelling of a Champion. Um, usually this installment focuses on the stories of professional athletes, past guests have included uh, NBA champion, um, you know, Festus Azili and Lance Thomas, who is a Duke national champion and 10 year NBA veteran. Uh, last time around WNBA player, Allison Feaster joined me. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to do uh, for this installment, I was really thinking about um, a different format and invite some of the voices behind the athletes uh, to come on and share their experiences about the making of these legends, working for working for championship winning organizations, working with superstar athletes on these topics that transcend sport. Uh, so in a little bit, I'm going to introduce uh, three incredibly talented sport communications executives who have worked alongside uh, some of the most prolific sports stars of today. Um, Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, the, the Super Bowl champion, uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, Floyd Mayweather, and every other uh, boxer to Deontay Wilder and some of the biggest pay-per-view uh, telecasts that we've seen in the last decade. And of course, the legend uh, in Allen Iverson with um, a former Sixers uh, PR guru now still in the NBA with the Pacers. So when I think of this Chalk Talk uh, and, and the championship uh, theme, I was thinking about my time uh, with the Golden State Warriors where I had a team PR role. Um, and the role of these PR managers really um, in an organization is to deliver facts is to facilitate access and to help tell the story. How can we provide information on tight deadlines while serving the journalists, serving the organization, and highlighting the athlete or executives and coaches story? We need to deliver that on a 24-hour timeline while being accurate. Um, you want to facilitate the access when you know, you're trying to position your organization in the best way possible. How can you provide those opportunities for your coaches, for your players, uh, for your team members and your organization uh, while balancing the needs of everything. And now we know with new media, there are a multitude of forums to tell stories, whether it's the you know, traditional uh, you know, sport film documentary, uh, national broadcasts, uh, even getting into social media influencing and bringing in others into the fold to help tell those stories where they will have uh, you know, the most um, excitement and the, and the most captivated audience. And then of course, finding and telling genuine and compelling stories. Uh, you know, the Golden State Warriors, I embarked on my journey there uh, in 2014. And I didn't know that we were about to become champions. We had the pieces, uh, we had uh, Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, uh, but I never thought in my wildest dreams that that first year, 2014, 2015, we win two titles in one year. Uh, the NBA G League uh, finals uh, went to the Golden State or the Santa Cruz Warriors. And we actually had two players that a couple of months later ended up playing for the NBA champion Golden State Warriors. So that was the first time in NBA history where multiple players played on two championship teams in one season. Uh, so learned a lot there. And then, you know, just kind of thinking about when you are besieged with media requests during a, the start of a dynasty, you're getting these stories. You're getting the, you know, the GQs and the sports illustrators and the slams. That's going to come to you with a winning organization. But how do you still keep that, uh, you know, publicity mindset as a sport communications executive and try to find and tell the lesser known stories. Um, you may have heard in the last couple of days that uh, Golden State renewed their uh, sponsorship and partnership deal with Rockton. Uh, back when the Jersey patch was just launched, this was a, you know, a business that wanted to get into the US market and they chose Golden State to you know, integrate themselves. And one of the roles we were tasked with was figuring out storytelling around something that, that maybe you know, media, they're not clamoring for. So how do we get 
industry uh, stories out there. What is Rakuten? What, why are they partnering with Golden State? And then be able to prove and um, renew the deal years later for a bit more money, which ended up happening this week. Uh, what about the hearts and minds? Um, don't forget a team like Golden State, uh, you know, on their championship dynasty rise, they played in the Bay Area. So what are you doing to engage the hearts and minds and telling those community stories? I think about, you know, the yearly visit to Santa Quentin that had been happening for years before, you know, Kevin Durant um, really put that story on a major platform with his production company and Fox Films. Uh, that is something that year after year, uh, the players and the coaches would go into San Quentin maximum security prison and play a game of pickup and humanize, you know, the people that uh, don't always get that love, don't always, you know, get to engage, of course. So things of this nature, when you are besieged with media requests, how are you keeping that champion mentality and pitching those unknown stories, amplifying athletes' voices, uh, seeing things that maybe only you're privy to and then finding a home for it to inspire others. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about today with the three incredible people I have joining me tonight. Uh, we have uh, Lisa Milner Goldberg, who is just, I call her the first lady, lady of boxing. Uh, she had an illustrious career uh, working for Swanson Communications, where she promoted some of the biggest fights known to man, worked with some of the most incredible boxing champions that we see today, uh, including Floyd Mayweather, Deontay, uh, Canelo, all of them. Uh, she also now has her own agency, Coast to Coast PR, where she is working with Angel City FC, some of the most um, interesting stories you could ever see before the official launch, before a team has ever played a game, uh, and seeing a lot of those stories pop up about women's empowerment and women's sports and challenging a new sport model, um, all while making, you know, social justice dialogue and gender equity at the heartbeat of the story that they're telling. Um, of course, you will see a common thread with all three of these big, beautiful brains is that uh, we all cross paths uh, together at the XFL as a part of the 2020 launch. Um, we owned our own markets from LA to New York to DC and of course Tampa Bay. So that will be a common thread that we'll talk about later on in the night. And then uh, along with the ride, and this is going to be hopefully uh, a little longer than I think it will be, uh, but Mike Preston, who spent a very good amount of time uh, with the Philadelphia 76ers as their director of basketball communications, is now the VP of comms and media relations with the Pacers. And the reason why I say we might lose him a little early is because he's literally at the arena on the road right now, and he has head coach media availability that he has to facilitate. So he'll be cutting out a little earlier. We'll get to him first. Also an XFL league launcher, never late to practice. We'll talk about that story in a little bit. And then, of course, we have a Super Bowl champ, uh, Alan Barrett, who spent not 14, I'm cut, I'm, I was sorely mistaken here, 15 years in the NFL, um, over a decade just with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, got his first ring um, and has BFFs named Tommy and Rob. And again, no uh, relation there to Brady and Gronk or, or maybe not. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome them all. So you see them all right here on our grid. How are you guys tonight? Good, how are you? Awesome. Good. Doing great, <laughs> thanks for having us. Well, welcome. Thank you for, you know, participating in this uh, NYU Chalk Talk. Mike, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, we have a lot to talk about here. When nope. you first joined the 76ers, <clears throat> you had the opportunity to work with Allen Iverson. And a yes. few years before that, you had the infamous and now legendary practice rant that encapsulated Iverson for what seemed what he seemed to be, I guess, in the media. Mm -hmm. That funny, that proud, one of a kind, maybe a little bit misunderstood. Mm -hmm. uh, but while many things associated with Iverson are all of those adjectives, the real story behind his words is probably a little bit more complex than is often remembered. So question here, what was it like working with Iverson uh, in the time that you overlapped before he was traded to Denver? Yeah, he was, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Yes, it's, it's very nice to the clock. So you can see exactly how much time I have. Uh, 
Lisa and Alan, uh, hello as well. Nice to see you again. Yes, I, I think you touched on it uh, earlier, Gina. Alan, you know, I had worked with the Miami Heat, the Baltimore Ravens, but I had never encountered um, an athlete like Alan, who was still at the peak of his, you know, cultural zenith, and he was an icon and remains an icon. And I, I think one of the words that you brought up earlier that really captured him in all of his essence is he was authentic. Um, he, he didn't, and still to this day, does not care about anything other than those who care about him and those who are important to him. And, you know, if you had told me when I first walked in there in 2006 and saw everything that was going on with us, you know, <clears throat> leading up to the trade, and then we resigned him in 2009, I would not have told you that he was a guy who would have you know, thanked me in his Hall of Fame speech and FaceTimed me last night. And he, he and that all speaks to him and what has made him so unbelievably important in not only sports on the court, but off the court is that he is true to himself. And it's something that, you know, a lot of people I don't think understand because at the end of the day, you know, especially us in a PR comms role, we want to try to put the best face on something. We want to try to make sure the story we're telling will resonate because we have to worry about our brand and the organization and our ownership groups and executives. And Alan cared about none of that, which made our, my job and others uh, a little more difficult. But um, it was something that when you go back, Gina, and you talk about that press conference and the practice press conference and what it meant, it was nuanced and it was layered. And it was something that people uh, happily and for clickbait reasons take the be talking about practice clip, but, you know, he was talking about a very rough period in his life and he was trying to minimize what basketball meant as it related to things that were very important to him and remain important to him to this day. So uh, he's one of my favorite people. He is as unique a person as you will ever encounter. And uh, I, do, I love the guy. I love him. It's always awesome to hear, um, you know, you, everyone has recall when they think about Allen Iverson um, and to just hear a little bit more of behind the scenes, behind the man, what, what it was work, like working with him on a day to day is, is really important. When I think about um, how it has changed since that time, it was probably 2006 when you joined uh, the Sixers. And that was before Twitter, that was before social media, that was before, um, you know, the, the convergence of digital really transformed how PR people have to do their jobs. Yeah. Now teams and leagues can break their own news. So, you know, uh, contextualize that a little bit for oh, us. Oh, it's, it's so interesting. I will tell you and, you know, Alan and Lisa and you can all relate to this and I'm sure others on the call. I started so long ago that one of our beat writers would often call me saying he couldn't go forward with a story because he needed two sources. <laughs> I was like, wow, I would kill for somebody to ask me uh, to be a second source in this day and age for a story that is verifiable and not simply, uh, you know, to your point, uh, Gina, not simply something that they can say they had first, not simply something they can say it takes in no regard for the people that they're covering or the organizations or those who have to deal or answer to this because they want to make a name for themselves. They want to break through the clutter. They want to become the news that they purport to be reporting. And, you know, that's certainly more relevant in major markets. I've found it certainly is not the case here in Indiana, where it's a much more, you know, collaborative effort. And it's, there's an understanding on both sides from me to the media and the media to me and from the organization and others. And, you know, when you talk about digital and social and how that has impacted, you know, what, you know, news versus infotainment is, um, it, it's, it, it's a line that I think we're all sort of fighting on a daily basis. Um, we're trying to find middle ground. And for me, my whole philosophy has shifted. I would just as soon get something out through our team social channels and then push it out to the media because I can control the narrative. Uh, I, I have a better understanding of how I can, uh, you know, tend to the news that is important to us and then deal with the noise uh, that comes in behind it. How do you even begin to coach players on how to, you know, navigate breaking our news or, or what sort of content to post? Um, because you can't, you definitely certainly can't control that. You can only manage and influence to a certain degree. 
And yeah. you know, you've worked with athletes that, that have done an amazing job. I think of Andre Iguodala. I think of mm-hmm. you know Holiday. Um, people that have you know transcended their personality beyond uh, you know who they are on the court, right? But you know we've probably all had our moments where we're like, ah, oh, did you really need to to tweet that? Uh, so what are your best practices for the athletes yeah. that you work? With? I, I have to say, and I don't mean this to sound anything other than like I'm a parent. Um, you know, I have two kids, and you know the thing with parenting is you're constantly communicating with your kids, right? You're you're letting them know your thoughts, your feelings, rights and wrongs, and consequences of actions. And you know this is certainly apples and oranges, but I bring it up to say the way you uh, the way you coach that is through constant communication, and you learn about the the athletes with whom you're working and you learn about the coaches and you learn about the front office staff and ownership when it's applicable because you, you know I would say to these guys often in jest largely but with just a tinge of truth like what would Mike Preston say if you tweeted that like if you want to engage in a two week long back and forth with me about how we're going to fix it and how we're going to clarify it and what you're going to say to your coach and what you're going to say to your family and what are you going to say to all these fans and people who are going to come back to you and are your teammates going to want to talk about that? You know, it's all these little things that sort of add up where hopefully in the back of their mind, they understand that a, you know, maybe it's not worth it, but Gina, more importantly, it's B. I do think this is worth it. I do want to talk to Mike, you know, Joel Embiid would be a great example. I mean, there are times where, you know, he and I would have, you know, we would have conversations about it. And there may be things that I certainly in the short term didn't totally agree with, but I always came to the place that if this is his personality and is not going to do any type of serious short or long run damage to the brand, either the Sixers or Joel's, then do it and have fun and lean into it and own it. But not every player and not every athlete is like that. So just knowing that you know, you are there for them as a resource, you are there for them with, you know, decades of experience that you can lean on, and you're a a sounding board. And if, you know, we can help, if we can help finesse their message in a way that they do deliver it on their social channels, um, again, that's something I am, I am all for. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to go throw it over to Alan. Yeah, I have a few words. I am going to Alton and Lisa, first of all, for the panel, you are now getting to what I like to call the the actual crux of the intelligence portion of this. I was here simply for uh, to be another panelist to show that I knew how to use Zoom. Um, these two folks that you're about to hear from are dear friends. They're amazing people. They lifted a league in the XFL that would still be flourishing due in large part to Gina included. Um, I will certainly try to log back on here when I'm done my responsibilities, but um, I wish I could be here to hear this. You go get them. Pacers. Go Pacers. Go Pacers. Uh, tickets available uh, NBA.com backslash Pacers. Oh, Preston, Thanks, it's so good to see your face. <laughs> so, Alvin, I have, I think, eight words for you to start this off. You won a Super Bowl with Tom Brady. Uh, talk about just this whirlwind last, call it season and a half. Uh, you know, coming out of COVID, coming into, uh, you know, a return to play type scenario and having the greatest of all time on your team. Yeah, uh, it's been a whirlwind for sure. Uh, thank you for, for including me in this for the invitation. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. And it's been a remarkable experience. It's uh, certainly uh, a little extra background on my time. So I was with the Buccaneers. I joined the team in 2008 and then had the chance to help launch the XFL. So I left, uh, didn't leave Tampa, but I I left the Buccaneers and um, then had the chance to return last summer, uh, two summers ago, um, right leading up to the 2020 season. So I would say um, not only the opportunity to return back to a franchise that I had really deep roots with, uh, and a long history there, but to, um, to have the chance to return in the middle of, I think most importantly, like in the middle of such a unique time for all of us in our country, where we were all trying to 
experience and navigate what was happening with the pandemic um, and trying to operate our daily lives and figure out what sports were going to look like. I think sports, you know, it can be such a, it really brings people together. And I think we found that as live sports started to return and it can be a really powerful unifier. And for the fans in Tampa Bay uh, and everyone here in this community to have such an exciting season during a time of so much unknown uh, and so many questions that were impacting all of us, um, that I think excitement and that optimism and positivity, I think meant even more to, to everybody here. Uh, and you know, when you, when you had the, the huge uh, impact that the household names like Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski, you know, these are future Hall of Famers um, at their, their positions, the best to ever do it. And, uh, and they're, they're, those are names that transcend the sports world, right? So those are names that you don't have to be a football fan to know who they are and what they mean uh, to those who get the chance to come in contact with them. And to have them representing the Buccaneers uh, following, a, unfortunately, you know, a long stretch where um, you know, probably expectations weren't met and a lot, of, a lot of good learning experiences, I think, for those who were involved here. Um, to then turn it around, I think, pretty significantly and drastically and end with the Super Bowl. And to be able to play that Super Bowl at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa and make history in that sense, too, it was, uh, yeah, it was historic. Nothing, nothing short of, of special. I, I honestly, um, you know, I can't imagine what uh, just the, the recall of life, the recap when you're contextualizing these memories of, of everything you said, returning to sports, a pandemic, um, working with players that are, you know, dealing with everything that we're devastated by as a society from uh, the social justice initiatives uh, to, you know, player health and wellness and safety. And, you know, th these ideals of, you know, escapism is football an escape when we're going through such a challenging time as uh, as a country, as a as a world, as a collective, right? So um, your role actually, when you return back to, you know, the, the Buccaneers, your role shifted to a community PR role where now you're amplifying, you know, player community initiatives and you're experiencing firsthand how community and social causes and sport can really galvanize an entire region, one that you spent a good amount of your life in. So what you can, what can you share, I guess, about that experience? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, one of the themes of this, obviously, that, you know, while we're you know, what we're discussing tonight is you know, working in sports and in my case in the NFL, we have such a, such a platform, you know, such a unique and notable um, opportunity to tell stories, right? Whether it's from, from the athletes, those that are playing the sport to just the organizations that, you know, do it as, as a team and for all of us to kind of have these voices heard and get eyeballs and, and ears on us that you might not get from another organization or working in another profession. Um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm personally, I'm pretty blessed to have a really rewarding and unique opportunity every day where I, I do get to you know, come in and I, I do have that, that PR communications track and, and that is my focus. Uh, and I get to work closely with our players, our coaches, our executives, but I really get to focus on how we're making a difference in other people's lives each and every day. And I get to find creative ways uh, working with our community impact department and our content team and the players and our staff, everybody here. Um, how do we tell these stories that we all feel really good about? And that's also not working, only working internally, but externally with our media as well. So, um, you know, you, you referenced you know, social justice, and that's something you know, our team launched a social justice initiative back in 2018, and uh, for a number of years, um, carried out a, a variety of different programming and events to really gain a greater understanding here in our community about, you know, learning and, and, and really educating ourselves about some of the challenges that are happening uh, here in, in different parts of Tampa Bay. And we've got a social justice player board. So it's four players who have really taken the lead to 
um, carry out those discussions in the locker room and with our executives, and then really be the face of that outside in the community. Um, so for us, that wasn't going to stop just because of the just because of COVID, but there were certainly new restrictions to that in terms of how we could do that. So we ended up launching a, a mentorship program that was players and coaches combined, players and staff combined. So we had individuals from all over our organization serving as mentors for students at a middle school in East Tampa, a meeting uh, twice a month and talking about really important topics and um, really building up these students as leaders. And it, and it was all virtual. And it still, you know, it gained momentum as the year was going on and you saw a difference in, in these students and how they were more confident and how they were interacting. And that's continued this year and year two. We just started back up a few weeks ago. So um, it, is, it is unique in, in the, that I really get to focus on, on the community side of it. And at the same time, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and very rewarding. So, you know, I wouldn't change it so much it's been really um, wonderful to see this new era of athlete activism and organizations really backing their athletes uh, regardless of how um, I guess siloed one of their causes might be uh, we haven't seen this uh, yet you know taking just public stances and supporting players on social initiatives things that we just can't ignore anymore so there's an intersection between um, you know, what is happening in different communities, especially communities of color, uh, when we talk about police brutality and things like that. So the NFL has has gotten a little bit more, I call it progressive, uh, in supporting players through overt dialogue and programming. Yeah, for sure. And and I think it's um, it's something that I think can be felt. I mean, the, the league, I think the league office has, has really made a point of that with the Inspire Change Initiative. And... Um, and, and teams, you know, have, have also started, I think the teams have supported that and, and teams have found different ways that work really well for those individuals in, e in each franchise and organization. And, and um, for us, it's, it started with our players. So in our social justice initiative, it, it is a player led initiative. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers Foundation, speaking on behalf of us, you know, we, uh, we started a social justice matching fund where the foundation will match donations that players want to make towards causes in our community that have a tie to social justice. And um, that's a, you know, I think that's a strong way to show our players that the organization has, has their back and is here to support them. And if they're passionate about something, well, the team wants to double that impact um, and help that, that uh, difference go as far as it can. Absolutely. And I know we've all loved watching those stories evolve. Um, I'm going to move to Lisa, who has been here with us. Uh, she always tells me that boxing has the best stories. And Lisa, over your time with Swanson, you worked with everyone from Floyd Mayweather to De Deontay Wilder and promoted some of the biggest fights in the last decade. So tell us, why is storytelling boxing unlike any other sport? Um, first, I just want to say thanks for having me and I'm not being facetious when I say I think about the XFL every single day in some way, shape or form. And you guys were a big part of that. And, um, it was just such a great experience and I'm so glad you brought us back together, Gina. Thank you. Um, so I, the answer to that question is, is broad and also, you know, kind of narrow as well. I think part of it is, you know, by nature, you've made a decision in your life to fight for a living, right? And what does that drive? Why do you do that? I mean, I think a lot, unfortunately, a lot of fighters, you know, come from very little and decide to walk into a boxing gym because they feel that they don't have another choice. Um, and that motivates their entire life. I think they find a love for it. I think a lot of fighters, it's a, a generational thing. There's a lot of fighters whose fathers and uncles are their trainers. Um, and that's not an accident. Um, but you know, based on my experience in the XFL working with football players, I realized that a lot of, um, the storytelling that came out of boxing is because these individuals are, have to be extremely motivated because they're not on a team. Yes. They have 
you know, their corner men, they have the people that stand around their gym telling them they're the greatest, but you know, at the end of the day, when that bell rings, it's them and another person. And also fighters generally don't go to college. And I think that being with the football players showed me how much discipline um, you learn by being on a team and being, you know, at a university or in high school where you are forced to show up on time and all of those things. And, you know, the greatest boxers take their role as, you know, a rising champion or a rising prospect that eventually becomes a champion extremely seriously. And those are the greats, right? And so, you know, that is a transformational um thing for these athletes and it comes as an individual which I think it makes it a little bit different than an athlete that's on a team wonderful answer and I know we um first crossed paths and came to know each other when I was working um in boxing I think we did I did four cards to your 104 cards maybe more um but what I I had learned in my short time as a boxing promoter is that every one has a story and uh, some of the most compelling ones. I mean, um, you're one fight away from, from going back and being a bricklayer. You're, you know, you're one fight away from, um, you know, complete and utter devastation when you're trying to put food on the table. It is like the, you know, some of these, these fighters, it's like they're at their last chance, last resort. So when you think about having the privilege to tell these you know, human interest stories and to help amplify the voices of people that are literally fighting for their lives and their livelihoods. Um, Is there anything that comes to mind, Lisa, you know, a particular fighter you've worked with or particular fight card that you were involved in that you can talk to us about? Oh my God, there's so many. Uh, Yeah, I started in 2008. Um, At the time Floyd Mayweather was retired, he came out of retirement in 2009. um, And I worked in boxing until I joined the XFL in 2019. So that's 11 years, um, my entire adult life, basically. Uh, And I started, I don't know, you know, there's a significant amount of people on this call and I don't know how much you know about boxing, but when I started, a lot of these gentlemen who are now almost elder champions uh, were just coming up and that's like Danny Garcia, Adrian Broner, um, Victor Ortiz, like Deontay Wilder, um, I watched them turn pro and I became very close with them and got to know their families. And, you know, it is hard watching, (laughs) watching them step into the ring when you have that relationship with them. But, you know, I also started luckily working with um, Oscar De La Hoya and Shane Mosley and Bernard Hopkins and, you know, uh, Miguel Cotto, some of these, you know, unbelievable champions who took, the belt very seriously, right? But, you know, on those cards, and some people don't even know this, there could be up to 12 fights and they start at one in the afternoon. If you're watching a fight at 10 p.m. Eastern time, there's already been like eight hours of fights in the ring sometimes. And so those people, they're not making a salary. They're not making millions of dollars. They might be making $3,000. And once you pay your corner and once you pay, you know, your other, your nutritionist or whatever, like that's not a lot of money that's left. And sometimes those guys have the best stories and just, you know, I I could talk about Floyd or some of these other people, but I mean, and they all have incredible stories. You know, Deontay Wilder has a a daughter with spina bifida. That's why he didn't go to Alabama and play football. He went to box because he knew he'd make money right away um, to pay for his daughter's treatments. And I I mean, if you follow boxing, you might know that story, but that's just, you know, one story. But one of my favorites is uh this fighter Tony Harrison from Detroit um we were talking you know I I always would interview a fighter right when they would we would work on a a fight card of theirs and you know I I was just like asking him you know how'd you get into boxing who's your trainer like the boring normal stuff and then I was like what do you like to do when you're not in the gym thinking oh I like to you know hang out with my friends or my family he's like oh I coach a a football team for eight-year-olds after school and I pick them all up after school and we haven't lost a game and I'm taking them to Florida to you know be in the national championship this pop warner football team and I was like oh okay and uh I wouldn't have gotten to that if I hadn't talked to him and then we got it on CNN you know that like if you don't talk to these people you're not going to get to that point and you know then he became more famous and then he got to be on better cards and 
you know, that's just, you feel like you're contributing a little bit if you're able to make them a little bit better known and get more eyeballs on what they're doing. And um, I think that was the most rewarding part of working in a tough sport, so. Absolutely, and I know both Alan and Lisa could probably relate to this or really anyone that has worked in a team PR role, oftentimes you're, you know, you're finding yourself in this dual role of being a protector and a promoter. Um, trying to, you know, make sure that your your athlete that you're working with is taken care of. Um, you know, in my early days with with Golden State, I remember, you know, going on all the road trips. And in the G League, we were taking, you know, buses from, you know, flying into Indianapolis, two flights over, driving three and a half hours to Fort Wayne, staying in these crazy hotels and motels. And that's where, you know, you, you really get to know um, and you become really emotionally engaged with you know, the athletes you're, you're working with. Um, so, you know, when I think of boxing, uh, you know, this would be a, a wonderful time just to remember Patrick Day, who was one of the most incredible, promising, you know, young fighters uh, and had everything in the world going for him, you know, was educated, was, uh, you know, had a future in whichever direction he wanted to go. And he actually lost his life in the ring, um, you know, shortly after a couple of the fight cards I, I worked on with him. And it, it changes you. It changes you when you, um, you know, you work so closely with an athlete. And you know, not every story that we tell has has an ap- happy ending. So uh, rest in peace, Patrick Day. And you know, with regards to boxing in general, it's again, it's it's life or death. You know, boxing is one of those sports where we've seen, you know, over five, you know, athletes lose their life due to uh, trauma sustained in the ring. And just in the last two years or so, two and a half years. So um, it's one of those things that we don't ever really talk about, but we do care and we do engage and we want to see, you know, the best possible outcomes for the athletes we're working in. So how do we do that? How do we best amplify um, their amazing qualities and help tell their story? Uh, Because it's certainly linked with, you know, their brand building and everything that is of value today for the modern day athlete, 360 degree view. Um, Speaking of the crazy stories, XFL is what is the is the tie that binds us. Um, let us just quickly walk down memory lane. I have a slide here that I want to pull up for everyone, just so we have an understanding of the unprecedented access that came with this league. And you know, Alan and Lisa, myself, Mike were half of the team uh, from a PR standpoint that helped coke create sign off on these crazy unprecedented access rules with the broadcast. So along the the left side of our screen here, we're talking about in-game communication, all this live and uncensored coverage of team communications during and after games. Now you talk to anyone that works in a team PR role, um, they will have never had to deal with something like this. I mean, players have live mics that the broadcasts can tap into. They receive the direct feed. That means coach to player communications accessible in real time. Um, the broadcaster rules of engagement. So after a, you know, a big play happens, uh, you know, they're running out onto the field literally in the end zone to go and grab that player. There's no needing to wait. Uh, or or hang back. The only time that interference could be run by a PR rep is if the player is going through a concussion protocol. Otherwise, you know, if there's an injury, if there's, you know, a a potential um, snafu, the broadcaster could go grab them, put them on live TV as this is all unfolding. So we're talking like real life reality TV in a sports setting while football is happening. Um, Social media the XFL was huge in repurposing clips that were happening in game on the broadcast. So they're living again on the second screen with people having an opportunity to engage if they're not actually tuning into the game. And then, you know, first opportunity to address anything that happened over the course of, of the game is like, you have two seconds. Hey, this was said, this was said, they, they let your mic go live on, you know, this was picked up on, on national television you don't have a ton of time to help prep them because there are cameras around the locker rooms at all times. So we launched this league, you know, we all came on about, you know, six or seven months before uh, the start of, you know, of the XFL 2.0 in 2020. What do you guys remember uh, from this as we kind of think back to this, this time in our, in our lives here? Well, I can say that it was um, 
it was an unbelievable experience and a ton of fun uh, that started with the people. I think that's, you know, for me, that's what it always comes back to. And uh, there were a lot of fantastic people um, that were involved in, in making it uh, what it was, including those on this call. Um, but for me personally, it was a really, uh, I think it was a really helpful experience because I, um, I'd say partly was allowed to, but also partly forced to think a little differently than maybe I had previously and, and really, uh, really think outside the box and lean into the entertainment side of the product more so than the tradition of how things have been done because there really wasn't a tradition. We were writing it, we were creating it. So uh, in that sense, that was, um, that was a lot of fun. It, it was also um, different for me and having to really kind of change, you know, you always, I think you always have a guard up to some extent, but what that was, was redefined, you know, in terms of being, becoming more comfortable in, you know, something that was very different from what I would have previously been, been comfortable being, you know, allowing to happen or to be part of facilitating, like you mentioned, live in-game interviews, seeing reporters running throughout a bench area on a football sideline in the middle of the game to try and grab a player to get his reaction after a big play that maybe did go your team's way, maybe didn't, to tap the head coach on the shoulder in the middle of calling plays to let him know that in 15 seconds, all of a sudden his coach to communicate coach to coach communication is going to drown out because the broadcasters upstairs are going to come down to him live and want to ask him a couple of questions in the middle of the game. And I hope you're on board with that because that's going to happen. Uh, so that was an important, um, very cool, important experience. And I think, you know, in order for that to be successful, you have to have buy-in from everyone that's a part of it. And, and I think we did. And, and um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It's interesting because I had like almost the exact opposite experience. Like I came from out of the box and was like kind of being put in a box, even though like I, I found myself in like the perfect transitional scenario where it was still super creative and like we could push the envelope, um, but like also traditional. And so it was a great learning experience for me because I was just doing whatever I wanted. There was no you know, league or uh, sanctioning bodies in boxing or like, you know, not really a thing. And so coming into the XFL, there were a lot of rules that I had to learn to follow. But at the same time, I got to work with these people who they just wanted to be famous, right? Like the players that were in the XFL, I always said like, you know, they were growing up their whole lives telling, saying that people telling them they're going to make the NFL. And some of them were in the NFL and some of them are in the NFL now. And like, a tweak of the knee in college and you're in the XFL. And so these guys wanted to be on TV, I would say most of the time. Um, and so that was fun for me because I would like be okay with, you know, putting them in a little bit of precarious positions, but at the same time, I'm like very protective of my people. And so it was a little bit hard when it would catch them in a wrong moment and I would have to tell them, okay, well, that was said on national TV, you're going to have to deal with it. Like, you know, it was tough. It was tough, but it was great. And this is making me like so nostalgic and sad, even though I'm happy where I am, but it's a nice yes. memory lane. <laughs> but, you know, the, the players had some of the most incredible stories. I mean, one of the gentlemen that I worked with at the Guardians, he was born in a refugee camp. Um, I'm not you know, what he was, his family was fleeing a war-torn Liberia. He was born in a refugee camp and his family was able to, you know, come to the States uh, where he settled in Baltimore and the odds he beat and the story that he had, the tragedy that struck him um, at, and his family over the course of his life is just something I've never, I could never fathom. And, you know, that was the story that really, you know, who are these players that are playing in the XFL, this new league? Um, 
And it's these people. It's it's the ones that like put football above everything. And this is their way up and out. This is their this is their light. This is their moment. And to be able to put them on a national stage in this brand new league was, you know, a privilege. Uh, Lisa, you, I remember, you know, how you got to know these players. You'd go and on these bus rides, you'd sit next to them, and you know, you'd be like, "Tell me about yourself. Like, who are you? What, you know, what do you like to do? Uh, is there anything you remember from just?" the getting to know you phase and figuring out who these guys are and how to best amplify their voices. Oh my God. We don't have enough time for this. Like that. I, the day that they reported to mini camp, I sat for eight hours and talked to about 40 of them, I think, and um, learned like so much. And, you know, I could rattle off tons of stories. One of them um, that was super fascinating was defensive lineman who was working in a funeral home in Maryland and came to play in the XFL um, and he just like, yeah, I, you know, I, I was working in a funeral home and then I got this call and, you know, then COVID hit and he went back to working in a funeral home during COVID and I stayed in touch with him and he had like inc- crazy stories and like, you know, can you imagine you think you're, you're playing football on national television one day and then you're going back and working in a funeral home during a global pandemic. Like that was the, the level of incredible stories that these players had. I mean, there was another guy who's lost his house during Katrina and his grandmother passed away in her house because she wouldn't leave. And he, all of a sudden we're sitting there asking questions and he breaks into singing amazing grace. And like, we put it on social, you know, like I could go on and on. It's just an unbelievable experience getting to tell those stories. And when we learned that the players were going home, I was so devastated. Like, when the league shut down, I was concerned because then we didn't have jobs, but I was devastated when the players went home. So, you know. Absolutely. Alan, anything, uh, you know, you can add about your experience in, in Tampa Bay? I feel like we were across from each other on the sidelines quite a bit. Our team scrimmaged each other. We were along that Eastern seaboard. We did everything together from media training to our centralized training camp in Houston a lot of time in the trenches with you, my guy. What what are some of your fondest XFL memories? We we certainly did, and um, yeah, I cherish I cherish all of them. I think particularly Tampa Bay, DC, and, and New York New York teams had were, were very tight, um, at least the on the executive side. Uh, and well, I, I'd say you know from a from a memory standpoint, that's one of the first things that stand out. You know, Lisa's talking about the relationships. And when we talk about storytelling, it, it uh, that's where it starts is, you know, how do you find these stories? It's getting to know those players. It's having those conversations, really learning about them on the personal personal side. And that's, that's not just for a start of football league. That's true for the NFL. That's true for, I think, any major, major or minor league sports, or if you're working at the collegiate level, it's you really need to take the initiative to get to know who you're working with. Um, you have to you have to care and you have to want to build those relationships. Um, for me, you know, some of the fondest memories are, you know, working with with the two of you, and, and because it's it was unique in the sense that we were all truly coworkers uh, building it together, as opposed to um, maybe different leagues where uh, they are. In the NFL, we've got 32 individual organizations that are all part of one one league, but um, we work for for different, you know, truly different franchises. Um, that was, uh, I think, a major difference and something that was pretty cool uh, was that we were all part of the same same team. At the end of the day, we all working together to build it, whether you were a player, coach, or on the staff. So, um, Alan, think- do you remember the first time I called you? Do you remember why I called you? Uh, enlighten me. Uh, we had a wildcat player that lived in Tampa and he was a teacher. He was a substitute teacher right. for that. That's right. And I called you and I was like, okay, I have a, a teacher that lives in Tampa and I want him, I want you to take him to a school or like go to his school and like hand out XFL stuff. And you were kind of like, I think at first you were kind of like, why would I do that? I don't work for your team. And then you kind of, it clicked that we were on the same team and then we did it and it was awesome. Do you remember that? It's a, it's a great, no, it's a perfect example of what, what I'm talking about where, yeah, I think the gut instinct initially was, 
Uh, I work for Tampa Bay and that's my focus. And that's great to hear, Lisa. Best of luck. <laughs> um, I hope I hope you're able to help help out with whatever you want to want to have happen. But at the end of the day, we actually collaborated and worked together uh, to tell a nice story. And um, at the end of the day, everybody won because of it. That guy's a coach at UNC now and getting his master's. Yeah, there you go. There you go. We're getting some uh, really great questions uh, from, from students. And uh, Tyler Woods is, is one of my students now and enrolled in my champions class. And he, you know, his question focused on collaboration between, you know, the Vipers and the Buccaneers. And I know obviously the XFL was short lived, but, you know, hypothetically speaking, Alan, if you want to indulge us a little bit, say when the XFL launches in 2023 and the Tampa Bay Vipers come back, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, space is available for two football teams in the great city of, of Tampa Bay? What's um, sort of community I, so, it's a very, it's a great question. Very uh, interesting one. I'd say I tend not to um, explore hypotheticals. Um, that's just Either not my DNA. Certainly. But what I, but what I can do is discuss because I do have the unique experience of having worked for two different football teams in the same community. You know, going from one to the other and then back to one again. Um, while there was not um, much overlap, and I think that was, that was certainly on purpose, I think because, because it was a spring league versus one that happens in the fall, you know, I think that really lent itself to how popular football is, right? And, and one of the, you know, football, you know, everyone loves football. Um, I say a lot of people love football, and, and there was an appetite for it at another time of year. So, um, that, I think mean, that proved to, to trend well and to have success, um, from a community standpoint, um, you know, there is, I think there's certainly a, you know, there's a 40 plus year history with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that, you know, there are families that have been raised, you know, has been raised Bucs fans. They're raising their children, raising their grandchildren as Buccaneers fans and, you know, having that time and having that history is, is huge to have on your side when you're building, building a brand and, and trying to set roots in a community. So um, from a, from like an initiative standpoint, I don't think in the, in the other experience, the spring league, you know, that weren't quite there yet, but what we were trying to do was establish brand identity and establish a fandom and a connection to something new and different that people could get behind and get excited about. Um, and that was cool and a little different and wasn't trying to compete with, you know, with the Buccaneers, wasn't trying to compete with or, or dethrone or overtake by any means. It was just trying to be its own thing and be another form of, of fun football entertainment. Absolutely. And speaking of establishing fandom, uh, Lisa not only has professional football boxing to her name, but uh, now you're starting to dabble with uh, Angel City and you've been behind, you know, the, the team from day one as a, you know, PR consultant for Angel City FC. Uh, you're going on photo shoots with, you know, Natalie Portman and Eva Longoria. I mean, my goodness, what a cool opportunity. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, your work with Angel City and, and the vision for the storytelling of this new franchise, which seems to already have emotional engagement uh, from a ton of fans, proponents of women's sport, uh, fans of, of soccer in general, and just, you know, excited for this, this new brand feel of Angel City. Um, yeah, we actually launched our jersey today. Um, so that was like a huge milestone for the team. Um, and yeah, I started working with them uh, officially in February. Um, but we don't have a ton of time, but if, if you aren't familiar with Angel City and you all are learning about sports and sports business, I highly recommend you read about it and learn about it because it is going to be an incredible case study on how to build fandom, how to make mission, this is what the president says all the time, mission and capital coexist in sports. The Angel City is raising tons of money and also doing tons of good work in the community. Uh, the 
our, our PR spin on the jersey, which you cannot buy for months because of the supply chain issues, but we promised that it would be revealed in 2021, uh, is that it is arguably the most impactful jersey in soccer because the three sponsors, which are DoorDash, Birdies, which is a women's shoe brand, and Sprouts Farmer's Market, which is a grocery store out here, um, have over time will be giving $2 million back into the community from the sponsorship that uh, money that they've given to support women's sports. Um, and so, you know, that is how Angel City is doing things differently and uh, in, amongst many other things. But as somebody who started, also started a team in Los Angeles, this is very different. We sold about, mm, I don't know, four or 5,000 season tickets uh, for the Wildcats. Angel City has already sold over 12,200 tickets and we only have one player and we have a coach and that is it. And the idea that there was such a hunger for women's soccer in Los Angeles to the point where they've been able to sell over half the stadium. We, I will not name the teams, have sold more season tickets than two men's teams in Los Angeles. And we sold all premium seats, which have an average of like a four-year commitment in three days. So, so like, this is an unbelievable launch an incredible like, mission and yes there's like a lot of star power behind it which helps um but i think what angel city is doing is really resonating it's hitting at the right time equal pay social justice like those are the backbone of angel city and that is you know so at the forefront of what's going on in this country that it's really you know a perfect storm of a sports story um wonderful we can't wait to see what's in store um we can't wait to you know your your team uh take the field and and see how that all lands obviously we're going to be rooting for you uh and your bffs in tampa bay uh you know rob and tom uh for sure and and hope that uh everything goes well for the rest of the season uh before we you know kind of end this this installation of the athlete's voice I'd love for you because I know I have a lot of my students on right now seeing their names and in, in the attendee list um, if anyone wants to navigate a, you know, communications career and do something like what Alan does and like what Lisa does, I would say, what is your advice for someone that is navigating the sport industry and potentially wants to explore uh, a role in team communications? I'll go to Alan first and then I'll come back to Lisa. I would definitely uh, make sure networking is at the top of your to-do list all day, every day. Um, continue to learn, you know, continue to read, continue to write. I don't think, you know, even in today's, uh, today's age where, you know, we're doing a lot of reading and writing on our phones with our thumbs, those basic communication skills will always be really important. So make sure you're keeping up with those. You're not going to be able to make it in this industry if you can't write. And, and so you need to make sure that you're still doing that all the time and writing, writing accurately, you know, making sure you're writing professionally um, and casting a wide net. That's one thing that I always say is regardless of if you want to work in sports and if you have an idea about what particular sport you might want to pursue down the road for a career, just because that's your end goal doesn't mean you might necessarily have the chance to start there. Uh, right off the bat, but the skills are so transferable, um, especially look, you know, you are two great examples having worked in literally in different arenas, um, same industry, uh, very successful, but if your dream is to work in the NBA, uh, don't just limit yourself to entry level opportunities in basketball, because you're good at what you do and you work hard and, you know, tell yourself you're gonna work harder than anybody else. Um, you can eventually make your way there. Uh, but that starts with, with casting a, a wide net. Um, I think like basically the same thing about the networking, but being super persistent yet polite is really important. Um, I, when I applied for my job at Swanson Communications, I reached out to my uh, then boss like at least 10 times no, no fail. And like, yeah, maybe in 2021 is a little different. Maybe you have to be a little bit craftier, you know, use LinkedIn and whatever. But I think 
being very, very, very persistent to get what you want in this industry is what makes you stand apart. And also, you know, this is advice that I should take often still is be nice to people because you don't know when you're going to need their help. I've always said that um, because there's a lot of people who start out as journalists in their own like blogs and things and end up writing for Yahoo. So always, I would say, give people kindness and the opportunities that that you would like. And I think that goes far. Beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful advice. I want to thank you both. And of course, uh, Mike, who had to depart early for head coach availability on the road in Detroit. Uh, this has been Alan Barrett from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Lisa Miller Goldberg of Coast to Coast PR and boxing legendary and Angel City FC. Um, and this has been uh, another installment of the Athlete's Voice. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you.